Thanks everyone for coming to today's talk. Today's presentation is in the vein of interesting cultural things that aren't immediately and directly related to folk dance. Although today I'm going to try to connect two parts of my life, that part which does folk dance documentation and that part which does field linguistics on an endangered language. Let me talk a little bit about my background and what my interests are. I am a folk dancer. I've been dancing Scottish country dancing since age five, and I started international folk dancing at age 15. I performed to the various ensembles like mandala. My main uh, teaching these days is at the Shala Folk Dance Club here in Tucson, Arizona. I also teach a university class for freshmen. Uh, we have 35 students in it this semester, and they're all very enthusiastic. I'm also a member of the Applied Intercultural Arts PhD program, and of course, many of you will know me most from my folk dance musings blog spot. I have another life. I am a professional linguist. I got my PhD in Chomsky and Syntax from MIT with a dissertation on Irish Gaelic syntax. I've been a professor of linguistics in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Arizona since 1998. And here I specialize in syntactic theory. That's the theory of how sentences are put together. Phonological theory, that's the theory of how uh, sound systems work, and in the documentation of the Celtic languages. This work has been supported by the National Science Foundation, as well as internal grants from the University of Arizona. Uh, I've written countless articles about the, these topics, and I've published 13 books. Since 2008, I've been working on the documentation of a highly endangered language, Scottish Gaelic, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And I hope it's of interest to folk dancers for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's just an inherently interesting thing to, to learn about. But secondly, because the work of documentation of languages is actually not that far from the work of documenting folk dancing. There's lots of similarities between language and folk dance. Both are means of developing community bonds. Both are used by groups to identify the members of that group. Both are used in ritual and social events. Both are vessels for the transmission of culture and tradition. Both are rhythmical and almost musical in a sense. Both are structured according to rules and principles. Both exhibit abstract patterning. Both are acquired through observation and participation rather than typically through overt instruction, although that's not true in our international folk dance community. When mastered, both are performed subconsciously, meaning when you have really learned the dance properly, you don't really have to think about it, you just do it. And the same thing is true when you're speaking a language. I want to connect these two sides of my life, the dance teacher and dance documenter and the documentary linguist. I, I'm gonna assume you're familiar with my work in folk dance documentation, so I'm gonna concentrate in this talk about my field work on Scottish Gaelic and the um, documentary and experimental work we've done. Uh, but I promise I will come back to dancing at the end of the presentation. I do want to spend one moment talking about someone who's very important to the work I'm going to be discussing today, and that's this lady, Muriel Fisher, who unfortunately died very tragically last summer. She was critical for the work that I've done. She was a close colleague, she was a dear friend, and she was my link to the community that I work with. The research I'm describing today couldn't be done without my team in my lab. This includes my team of faculty collaborators and a whole slew of students, uh, graduate students and undergraduate students who have worked for us. Let's talk a little bit about the language that is under investigation. This is Scottish Gaelic, or in, in Gaelic we say Gaelic. A couple of things about this. First of all, it's Gaelic not Gaelic. Um, you have Irish Gaelic and Scottish Gaelic. Secondly, it's Scottish Gaelic. It's not Scots Gaelic. You'll hear people refer to the language as Scots Gaelic, but that's incorrect. Um, Scottish Gaelic is part of the Celtic language family. Scottish Gaelic is an insular language. That means it's a language that is spoken 
on the Isles of Ireland and Great Britain. Uh, it's part of a branch known as Goidelic, which are the languages that are all descended from Old Irish. These are Irish, Manx, and Scottish Gaelic. Gaelic has never been the language of the population centers of Scotland. Instead, it's always been the language of the countryside. It also um, has been largely the language of the north of the country. The south of the country, they spoke Scots. As a consequence, when there was political suppression in Scotland, both by um, people from the south of Scotland and by the English, um, the language came to be associated with various rebel and independence movements, such as the, the famous battles of Culloden and the Jacobite rebellions. The language has been suppressed by political authorities for um, several hundred years. Um, so there's been political suppression. There's also been um, depopulation of these areas. Um, in the 1800s, there was a massive population exchange where the landowners decided that having people on their land was not profitable. And instead, it was better to have sheep. So they, um, they did what were called clearances. And they essentially packed whole villages of people up onto boats and shipped them to Nova Scotia and to North Carolina, where, um, where the people were sort of offloaded. Also um, into Northern Ireland, which was the start of the conflicts there. Um, these... Highland clearances effectively um, emptied the area where Gaelic was spoken of its population. And as a consequence, the language went into severe decline. So what you find is that if you go to Scotland, you'll see um, areas like this. Um, this used to be a village of about several hundred people, all of whom were essentially just thrown off their land and um, put on boats and sent to North America. Um, so you, you'll find this all over the highlands. You'll find these areas that used to be inhabited and no longer are and are nothing more than what we call tohta, which are ruins. There was also a notion in which it was important for people in Scotland to all speak the same language, a language which was the language of the rulers. And so there was also language suppression in education. It became punishable. Uh, offense to speak Gaelic in schools or in any kind of official capacity. You'll see that the number of Gaelic speakers has declined. So for example, just over 130 years ago, there were about 200,000 um, speakers of Gaelic, which constituted about 5% of the population of Scotland. You know, 20 years ago, it looked like it was around 60,000, which was 1%. Um, this number is probably an exaggeration because it's based on self-reporting. So they asked the question on the census, do you speak Scottish Gaelic? And if you said yes, you're included in this number. But that includes um, thousands and thousands and thousands of learners, second language learners, who have learned the language just out of cultural interest and don't actually speak on a daily basis. The actual number of people who speak the language on a daily basis is probably around 30,000. I have some random cows just because I, I love them. I think they're beautiful. So if we look in terms of geography at the language, you'll see that the language really isn't spoken in many places. It's primarily now spoken in the Outer Hebrides. This is Lewis and Harris, the Uists, um, Bara, Vatrice. In these regions, they still speak it quite regularly. You find it spoken in the north of the Isle of Skye, which is right here. You also find it spoken to a lesser degree in some of the other islands in the Inner Hebrides, like Isla and Mull. But for the most part, it is actually isn't spoken on the mainland of Scotland very much, just along this coastal region. Now, something that's important to keep in mind is that 90% of the Scottish population lives in this tiny little band of land right in the middle where Glasgow and Edinburgh are located. And in these regions, the language is spoken by a few people, but mostly they're people who have moved away 
from the traditional Gallic areas into these urban centers. The vast majority of the population lives just in this little tiny band. This area that's in this light blue color you see here is largely uninhabited. There are little villages here and there, but really there's very few people who live in the north. And as a consequence, the fact that it looks like half the country speaks Gaelic is a bit of an illusion. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about my research into Gaelic. I'm going to talk about three small examples of the kinds of studies we've done. We've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies, but I thought it would be interesting to just pull out three examples that might interest you all. The first is I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of documentary linguistics we've done. This is where we record native speakers of the language talking about their lives as a means of documenting this language before it disappears completely. I'm also going to talk about two experimental projects we have, particularly on the sound system of Gaelic, that bear interest into how the language is structured and what the rules and principles of the language are. I'm going to start by talking about language documentation. What we've been doing for the past 13 years is we've been recording video and audio of native speakers talking about things that are of interest to them. We do this by using fluent Gaelic speakers who work for us, like Muriel Fisher, who I spoke about earlier, and a couple of other people. They interview the, the Gaelic speakers in Gaelic. We give the participants wide latitude in what they're going to talk about. Sometimes we nudge them a little bit to talk about certain things. And occasionally we um, deliberately elicit information like, you know, what's the name for this for this kind of animal, that kind of thing. But we, we encourage the speakers to just talk about the things that they know the most about. They are, they are tradition bearers. They are people who know the songs. They are people who know all about the land. They are people who know about fishing techniques. They are people who know about dance and music. So we ask them to speak from their own experience and knowledge. We gather these video recordings and we put them in open access repositories for people to access, including the community. And we make sure that that data is going to be available to the communities forever. We also use the data for our own uses. We use it for doing linguistic analysis. So I thought I'd give you an example of the kinds of data we gather. Here's Muriel and Charlie McGilvery, who live in the little remote town of Erd, which is on the tip of the Slight Peninsula. And th this is an hour-long interview. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. I'm just going to show you a little clip. Here they are just talking about where Charlie came from. And what he's going to talk about is he's going to say where he was born. And you'll hear him talking about the fact that um, he actually grew up in a house that's just behind the modern house where they're living right now, and that his family have lived on this land since 1760. Well, Charlie, um, Krishna, in Shuga, Pekan, what was a hash of Kadrukish, etc.? Look, Miss Avala, Shahin, Hira Hosses and Taya, he were to hold of an heat. Oh, and a shit and jam, they and they had a guinea look, a gum, Dovarash out ga. So what we do with this kind of material is we then transcribe it into Gaelic and we provide a translation as well. So this is what is available for the community. They can find a transcript of what's been written both in Gaelic and with a translation. For our own purposes, we also modify this um, a little bit, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Let's look at another example. Uh, here's an example of somebody from the Isle of Isla, and he's talking to our native speaker interviewer about the parts of a traditional rowboat, and they're talking about the plug that holds the, the oar in place. The interviewer, by the way, is Adavo Boy, who was the Gaelic consultant for the Outlander series? Ah, 
I guess in that situation, she and Ree Marahira said that Erlen Jew Rollock Marahake. And yeah, Tholpen. Thol, T H O L E. Tholpen, the head of the bear. And the bear, like Rishin. Oh, good job. Who's that person? I'm going to have your back, get it on the news. So that gives you an idea of the kinds of interviews we do about cultural matters, like, you know, the parts of a boat, how the fishing was done, so that we get a real record of traditional Gallic culture in addition to actually getting examples of the language. We also recorded many songs and stories. Dixon's next clip is by the Gallic singer Christine Primrose, who's from the Isle of Lewis. And she's singing one of my favorite Gaelic songs, which is called Griegel Kria. And it's the lament for Gregor MacGregor, who was um, murdered by his wife's family. Uh, they, they captured him and beheaded him in front of her. And this is the song she sang to her family after it happened. This song always brings chills to my spine. Okay, uh-huh. Maha. All right, Maha. When I'm in the garden, I have me the whole inch of honey, me, because I'm more by you. Um, I had a shit, she 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 me so grand marim ah man tarik mi anwar va mohnia e vahra o va no va no va niri o I have one more example here. This is Muriel again. This video was taken when we were on a trip up to her village in Glendale, which is very remote. Once you get on the Isle of Skye, which takes you about 10 hours from Glasgow, it's about another three hours north um, on windy roads to get there. And when we were almost in Glendale, we ran across an old couple who were cutting the peat. There are no real trees on the island. So the way in which people heated their homes was by burning peat. Now what's peat? Peat is essentially dead organic matter that's in the bog, onu. You know, it's thousands of years of dead organic material. They cut it out, they dry it into bricks, and then they burn it in their stoves. And it has a very distinctive smell. If you know the smell of Scottish whiskey, that's, that's a peaty smell. Now Muriel went over to this couple and asked them, could we record you cutting the peat? And they wouldn't agree to us recording them. But they did say that we could record Muriel talking about how to cut peat and how to stack peat using their materials. 
So she's going to demonstrate how they stack the peat, and she's talking about how they dry it out because it's quite wet when it comes out of the ground and it has to be dry before it's burned. She's actually quite critical of the way these peats have been cut. She thinks they're not well formed enough. She actually says at one point in Gallic, these are shit. So uh, <laughs> she was a character. So let's listen to Muriel. Nishja. When we bring me on the mono, I guess had had a dune on the hill. I guess had the jira could have been up at a vone. You, I guess, um, was the whole she had at a nopper show. Va a vone you ulu na ve at a near on the hill. Ach hira mich a mulo hechke so norshen ha ach kadi chunda nishja shoka ma fluchar and da hu femimira. Ach on the hill. And the hill, as, as a fat as show, she crap once a grot a cat as show, ach had hoof shot chirim. I guess Nisha, she wish Nijana was Jewish doch a tree shakin and just joy a poin, but she in a macher of onu. I guess Vermichaka could at a has vek no at a has chrome. I guess Nisha shall ho has a fluch hammer crow. I guess the uh, next and do I guess I guess and So that gives you a little bit of a taste of the kinds of recordings we have made of speakers. We have several hundred hours of these uh, recordings, many of which are transcribed, but many of which are waiting for me to spend hours sitting there listening to them and writing down what the people are saying in Gaelic. We put them in a format that we can use as linguists. These are called three-line glosses. For each sentence, you'll find three lines. The top line is the line written in the Gaelic orthography. The second line is what we call a word-by-word gloss. So, ach means but, and shin means then, chai means went, mi means I, etc. And then the third line is a literal translation of what that line says. So, but then I went to Portree High School. Now, we put it in this format because this is a format that computer systems can run. We store it with various kinds of tags. So we'll, for example, mark chai as a verb and me as a pronoun. And we feed that information into a computer, create a big database, and that database can be used for things like ChatGPT, for example. I also personally use these as the data that I construct my analyses of Gallic syntax from. This, this kind of format allows me to, to talk about the order and structure in which the sentences are constructed. One of the things you'll notice about Gallic is it's a VSO language. What that means is the word order is different than English. In English, the word order is subject, verb, object. I went to school. In Gaelic, you put the verb first. So we have hai, mi, gu, arshko. So you've got the verb first, and then you have the subject, and then you have the rest of the sentence. This different kind of word order structure is the source of data that I use in my syntactic analyses. Now, we've also done other work on Gallic. Um, we've, we've done many experiments trying to figure out how native speakers use and understand the sounds that are put together into the language. And I'm going to describe here two experiments we've done. The first study we looked at was over something that's called nasal fricatives. Fricatives are sounds like F and V and S and SH and z, they all have um, this sort of vibration in them. And they're all made by creating a closure in your mouth that just has a little bit of space for the air to pass through, and it creates this frication. Now, Gallic has two sounds that in English we would write with the letter V, one of which is written in the Gallic orthography with an MH, and the other is written in the Gallic orthography with the letters BH. The reasons why they represent this as MH and BH instead of the letter V are a whole other talk for another day. But those are the letters they use to represent these. Now, Gallic speakers will tell you that these two sequences, 
MH and BH are two different sounds. The first one, the MH one, is said to have nasalization, meaning that you hear air going through the nose, giving it a nasal quality. And the BH is a non-nasal, so there's no air going through the nose. So I'll give you some examples here. So this MH is av, av, and the BH would be av, av, and av. Native speakers will swear up and down that this sound got nasalization on it, and this sound does not. Now, here's the problem for linguists. Linguists who have studied the articulation of sounds will tell you that a nasalized fricative is actually acoustically impossible. This is because when you blow air through your nose, you're decreasing the air pressure in your mouth. So you only have a certain amount of air you can push out through your nose and mouth. And if you're pushing air out through your nose, you can't push enough air through your mouth to create that frication sound. So you shouldn't be able to say, uh, uh. there I am just making it, but you're not supposed to be able to do that. So when linguists found out that Scottish Gaelic speakers believe that they have a nasal fricative, this caused a great deal of problems because it was really a challenge for articulatory phonetics. But we also realized that maybe the Gaelic speakers were wrong about this. So one of the first hints we got to this showed up on a sign to the village that's right next to the Gaelic College on Sky, which is called Ardvasar. And you'll note that these two signs spell the word Ardvasar in Gaelic different ways. One spells it with a BH, and the sign that is literally around the corner spells it with an MH. So the people who erected this sign on the right clearly thought that it had this nasal fricative, and the people who put up the sign on the left thought it didn't. So this suggested to us that maybe native speakers don't actually hear this sound or produce the sound the way they think they do. So what we wanted to do was test whether or not the MH sound actually had nasalization during the V. So we have equipment to do this. It looks a little bit like a Darth Vader mask, but we have a mask that they hold over their mouths, and that measures the amount of air coming out of the mouth. And we have a separate mask that you put over the nose, and that measures how much air is coming out through the nose. And so we're able to see when air is coming out through the nose relative to when air is coming through the mouth. Native speakers hate this setup. We had a, a terrible time getting people to actually do this experiment. They took one look at the equipment and were like, no, we're not going to do that. This is Muriel. She gladly let us take a picture of her using this. There were some other problems, which were we had a list of words we wanted them to say. And most of the speakers of Gaelic are fairly elderly, and they need glasses to be able to read the word list. But if you've got this nasal airflow mask on, you can't put glasses over your eyes. So we had a lot of trouble getting people to be able to read the word list while at the same time wearing the masks. Anyway, what were the results? Well, the results were actually quite interesting. What we have here is we have a waveform of them saying the words. This is the word avark, avark. And it has the MH, so it should be nasalized. And what we found with words like avark, and we, we have hundreds of tokens of different words, and this is just one example, is that in fact native speakers are not doing air through the nose during the V sounds. So if you sort of line things up here, if you look from the V going up, you can see where the V starts, it's about right here. And you have a small amount of oral flow but you have no flow through the nose at that point. Instead, the nasalization seems to be on the preceding vowel. So it's not actually on the V. So the native speakers are hearing and saying something with nasalization, but it's not where they think it is. Instead of being on the V, it's actually on the preceding vowel. Um, this is a kind of 
auditory illusion. They're hearing it on the V, but they're actually pronouncing it as if it's on the A. So it's avark, avark, with the nasalization on the A, and then you're just getting a straight up normal V without any nasalization. Okay, I'm gonna give you a second phonological example here. This has to do with a unique grammatical phenomenon in the Celtic languages called initial consonant mutation. Initial consonant mutation is a change you make to the first consonant in a word in particular grammatical contexts. The main initial consonant mutation in Gallic is called lenition, which means a softening of the sound. So what you find is that for sounds like P and B, they change from a, from a P sound to a F sound. And P becomes a V. And a M becomes a V. It isn't entirely consistent how these changes work. So with P, B, and M, you have a sound that has a complete closure of the mouth becoming a sound that has more space and you get a little bit of this frication. But with other sounds, other things happen. So for example, F disappears entirely. So the, the, the word for leave is fuck. And uh, if you put it in a certain grammatical context, it becomes ak. Um, sounds like T, D, and S, which are all pronounced right behind the teeth, they tend to be what we call debucalized. That's your fancy word for today. This is where you take away the articulation from the front of the mouth and you put it in the back of the mouth. So a T sound becomes a H. And a D sound becomes a R. And a, an S becomes a H as well. Where you take away the articulation right behind the teeth and you pronounce the sound right in the back of the mouth. These mutations, you'll notice, have all these H's in them. The, the little H is the indicator that you have had a lenition. And that's what makes Gallic spelling look so intimidating to people as they see all these sounds. But it's actually quite predictable that when you have one of these mutations, you put an H right after the first consonant and you change the sound. The sounds K and G uh, become H and R. So this is, this is what the sound changes are. Now, where does it happen? It happens in particular grammatical situations. So for example, feminine nouns like beel, this is the word beel, means mouth. When you put it after an article like a, uh, it becomes a veal. And there's plenty of examples like this. Um, if you've got the word for table, which is borscht, and you put it in the dative case, it becomes era vorst. Borscht becomes vorst. So you change that initial consonant in particular grammatical context. The most common grammatical context for changing these sounds is when you put a verb in the past tense, you do one of these changes. For example, the past tense of bool, which means to hit, is vool. That's how you know you've got a past tense. But there are restrictions. So, for example, certain sequences of sounds never undergo these initial constant mutations. So, for example, when you have a T sound, like in trosk, which means trout, and it comes after an N sound, as in shaun, which means old, you don't change it to chrosk. So it's not shaun chrosk, it's shaun trosk, even though in this context you would normally change this consonant. There's also certain sequences of sound that never change. So for example, an S consonant sequence never mutates. So you never get this change in this context. So it's quite a complicated little system. But there are principles under which it occurs. It happens in certain grammatical contexts, and specific changes happen. The question we wanted to ask was, is this, in fact, triggered by rules? Are there principles that native speakers use to turn unlinited forms, like borscht, into lenited forms, like vorscht? Or do they simply memorize all the different forms? 
It is a complicated system, so it's entirely possible they memorize it different forms. So let me give you a parallel in English. So let's say I make up a noun in English like freik. You know automatically, as native speakers of English, that the plural of freik is freiks. You have a rule that says add an s to a noun and make it plural. So that is a principle or a rule, and you can do it as you're speaking. If you hear a new word, you can apply the rule and get the, the plural form. But there's lots of exceptions to this rule. So, for example, we have sheep. The plural of sheep is sheep. The plural of child is children. The plural of ox is oxen, etc. Okay? Now, those ones, there is no rule. Instead, you just have to memorize the fact that the plural of sheep is not sheep's, and the plural of child is not child's. So, one question we had is, do speakers use a rule like adding the S in English, or do they memorize all the different forms? It's quite a complicated system, so memorization is definitely a possibility. How do we figure this out? How do we figure out if somebody has memorized a form or if they're applying a rule? Well, there actually is a psycholinguistic task that allows us to do this. It's a task called auditory masked priming, and it's, um, it's an experimental technique that allows us to investigate the speed at which people process words. What we do is we present the subject with two words. We'll give them first what's called a prime, and then we give them a target. And then we ask the speaker to decide whether the target is a real word or not. And we time their decision making. So we have a little box that times how long it takes them to make a decision about whether the word is a real word or not from the time in which they hear the prime and they hear the target. And a known effect here is that if a prime and a target are connected in the mind, usually sort of memorized forms, then they're going to be much faster at identifying whether a target is a real word or not. If you have, for example, child and children, and you give the speaker child, they're going to be faster at identifying children as a real word. So what we can do is we can actually test to see if the two words are connected in the mind by how long it takes the subject to decide whether the target is a real word or not. Now we do this using what we call auditory masked primes. We don't want the listener to hear the word just outright. We want them to hear it subliminally. So we don't want the subject to be consciously aware of it. So the way we do this is we play the, the prime, the, the word that, that we're trying to, to use to find out if it's connected to the main word, by playing it very quietly and playing Gallic being spoken backwards over it. This has the effect of masking it. So the subject can actually hear these words, but they're not consciously aware of them. I'll show you some examples in a minute. But what this sounds like is, for example, we're going to test the word bool. We want to know whether or not the word bool, which is the verb to mean hit, can be primed by its past tense form, which has the initial constant mutation, vool. And what the, uh, the listener hears is they hear this backwards Gallic, blah, 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 blah. And underneath that, there's a very quiet boo, boo, or boo. And then, then they hear the word, that the target word, really loud. And we time to see how long it takes them to decide whether that target word is a real word or not. What we find is that certain primes can affect the timing of their primes. So here is the example I gave you. We have the target word bool, and we want to see whether or not the lenited form, the form of the initial constant mutation, primes it or not, and if there's a significant difference. So what we do is we, we have four conditions for testing this word bool. We, first of all, test it 
with the word itself as the prime. So you get bool, bool. You get bool, bool. And needless to say, when you do that, the word is primed. They're very quick at deciding whether that's the word or not. We also then give them the form that's leninid. So they get vool, bool. And then just to make sure that there's not other stuff going on here, we, we give them a word with a, with a rhyme. So this is the word shul, which rhymes with bool. So we want to see whether or not it's just the rhyme that's priming the effect. And we give them a completely different word as a prime just to control, to make sure our timing effects go on. So let's hear these words in their priming condition. So the first one you're going to hear here is where you get bool and bool. <laughs> so you heard all that blah, 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 blah. And in the middle of that, it said bool. And then you heard the full word. Okay, the next one is where we've got the lenited form being the prime. <laughs> so there, there was bleep, bleep, bool, bleep, 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 bool. Okay, here's the rhyme. <laughs> and then the last form, we have the form shanchas, which is a completely unrelated word. It turns out speakers are quicker at identifying whether the form of the word is Gallic or not if they hear the related lenited form. So both when they hear the word itself and the lenited form, they're much quicker at identifying whether it's a word. This is the priming effect. Whereas if they hear the rhyme, the shul, or the completely unrelated control, they take a little bit longer. This suggests that they have memorized both of the forms, and they have both stored in their memories. And so they can be much quicker at figuring out whether the second word is a word of Gallic or not. So, some takeaways from my linguistic research for folk dancers and teachers. The kind of work we do is deeply community-oriented. It involves working with native speakers. It involves working with tradition bearers. It involves working with people who are deeply connected to the culture. And I think the lessons of the kinds of works that we do can apply to dance. So one thing we learned in doing all of this research is we require native speaker experts who work on our team. They can navigate cultural problems and they can help us construct materials like all those priming examples you heard. They can really sort of facilitate working with members of the community. These are people like Muriel or Adav, who you saw interviewing the guy with the boat. It also requires a community of participants who are willing to actually let us work with them, to do experiments or spend time talking to us, talking about their, their knowledge. I think both of these things are things that we as folk dancers can use to, to, to really improve our description and understanding and learning of folk dances. If we have native speakers like um, master teachers from the country, they can help us to really understand the context for dances and the ways in which we should go about studying them. And also, we need to be able to watch people who are actually from the community do the dances. It also requires that we produce things that are of use to non-experts. So speakers and dancers inside and outside the community need to be able to access the documentation and the teaching we do, you know, in order for it to be worth the time we put into it. And it's also important for us to recognize the responsibilities we have to support the communities that, that provide us with these rich cultural, linguistic, and dance-related traditions. I promised I'd come back to dance. Here's a quick little anecdote for you. On the Isle of Skye, I mainly work out of the Gallic College, and I was there doing research in 2018 and they often have community groups coming through the college during the summer, and they do events for them. And there was this group of English kids, kids from Essex, I believe, and they were expecting to have a cultural event put on for them. And so they were going to teach Kaylee dancing to the kids. 
And the Kaylee dance teacher that they have permanently on staff was in an accident in the morning and broke her foot, so she couldn't teach. And the guy who ran all these programs was in a complete tizzy. But Muriel, who was good friends with him, said, you know, Andrew teaches folk dance. Maybe he can teach some Kaylee dancing. So I ended up teaching a whole bunch of high school students from, from England how to do some Kaylee dances. I think you all recognize the dance. In Scotland, they call it the Progressive Gay Gordons, but you'll all know it as Tismija. Well, that's it. Thank you very much for listening to me today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and I'm happy to take some questions. I'll stay online um, in the chat, and we'll be happy to answer anything you uh, have questions about.